Welcome back to our class. This will be Lecture 10, Part 1. And what I want to begin to look at now in this particular section is looking at the specific claims of inspiration in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament. Now, the discussion to this point has entered on a few major texts that claim inspiration for the Bible. Now, attention must be given to the specific claims of each section of the book of the Bible individually. Is this specific claim in these books the same as the claim for them by other books? Becomes the question that we're going to attempt to answer here. To answer that question fully, the next several sections will discuss the claim of inspiration in the Old Testament, the claim for the Old Testament in the New Testament, and the claim in the New Testament for the, uh, uh, and the claim in the New Testament, and the doctrine of inspiration for the New Testament in the Church to the Reformation, and then the doctrines of inspiration since the Reformation, and the divergent views of revelation and inspiration in the modern world. So we have a lot to try to, to cover here. Whether we succeed doing that or not in our lecture series okay, will yet to be seen. However, it is covered in your studies, it is covered in your notes, and it is covered definitely in the reading of your textbooks of which you are required to read. Please stay on top of your reading. Now this present section is concerned with carefully examining what the Old Testament claims in and for its own inspiration. That's what we're going to look at. In fact, what we're going to do is we're going to look at individual books of the Old Testament and see what it has to say with regard to its own inspiration. And so I want you to understand that a brief examination of each of the books of the Old Testament will help to confirm in detail the thesis that each of the individual sections claims to be divinely authoritative. It should be noted that every book of the Old Testament does not have an explicit claim to divine inspiration. Nevertheless, it can be demonstrated and that most often, most of them do have such a distinct claim and that the remainder have the, either an implicit claim or a character that serves as an implicit claim to inspiration. And we're about to see that. So we're going to now, now at this section, we're just going to dive into a lot of detailed work, and you need to be ready. So I want you to see this with me so that you have a clearer understanding of what I'm talking about. There's just absolutely so much to cover, we simply don't have the time. Thus, you must be held accountable, and you are responsible for the reading. Now, in the book of Genesis, in Genesis, God spoke to the patriarchs, if you remember that. We see that in Genesis chapter 12. We see that in Genesis chapter 26. And we see this in Genesis chapter 46. And they made records, okay, in a permanent, what we would call the family album of the divine dealings under the title, This is the Book, the Records of the Generations of. You remember that? And this is how Genesis breaks out. He says this, he says, this is the book of the records of the generations of. And then it proceeds to lay down in detail who all these generations are. We see this in Genesis chapter 5 verse 1. We see in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. We see it in Genesis chapter 10, verse 1. We see it in Genesis chapter 11, verse 10. We see in Genesis chapter 25, verse 12, and verse 19. We see in Genesis chapter 36, verse 1. And we see in Genesis chapter 37, verse 2. Very clearly laid out for us, okay? of this divine inspiration that's laid out for us. In the book of Exodus, in the book of Exodus, the, re the record reads this way. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 says, God spoke all these words. In Exodus chapter 32, verse 16, and the tablets were God's work, and the writing was God's writing. Moses said to the people in Exodus chapter 35 in verse 1, these are the things that the Lord has commanded you to do. 
So we see with great clarity in the book of Genesis, and we see with great clarity in the book of Exodus that it in fact ascribes to itself uh, right, the, right, the, cal- the, the quality of inspiration, divine inspiration directly from God. In the book of Leviticus, the introduction to Leviticus says this, in Leviticus, in Leviticus chapter 1 verse 1 says the following, The Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of the meeting, saying. Also, we see in Leviticus chapter 4, verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, is found repeatedly, we see this. In Leviticus chapter 4, verse 1, we see Leviticus chapter 5, verse 14. We see Leviticus chapter 6, verse 1, and verse 8. So here again, we see that inspiration is coming directly from God to the human instrument that's actually writing out the Word of God. In the book of Numbers, in Numbers, the book repeatedly here records, and it records this, this phrase, the Lord spoke to Moses. The Lord spoke to Moses. We see this clearly in Numbers chapter 1 verse 1. We see this in Numbers chapter 2 verse 1. Numbers chapter 4 verse 1. Numbers chapter 5 verse 1. Numbers chapter 6 verse 1. Numbers chapter 8 verse 1. We also see toward the end of that book in Numbers chapter 36 verse 13 says, and it closes by saying this, And these are the commandments and the ordinances which the Lord commanded to the sons of Israel. So here, with great clarity, we see that the book of Numbers is a divinely inspired book of God. (coughs) Excuse me. Go to Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, we see as well, it says Moses, and and go to look look specifically Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. And it says here, you shall not add to the word which I commanding, I am commanding you, nor take away from it. So this is God's word. And Moses' speeches are regarded as God's word. Why? Because God said, you shall not add to the word which I, which I am commanding you, nor take away from it. It even sets forth the test of the truth for divine utterances. We see this in in Deuteronomy 18:22. Deuteronomy 18:22, and this is one of the this is one of those verses that it, it cannot be said enough of, and, and it speaks extremely clear with regard, and at least in this postmodern era that you and I live in, uh, with regard to all of these so-called quote-unquote prophets running around making all kinds of prophecies that don't come to pass, and so forth and so forth. Well, let me tell you something. Here is the one verse that speaks. Extremely directly to that issue, and at the same spot, at the same time, the divine inspiration of God Himself in His own word. It says in Deuteronomy 18:22. He says, the, He says this: When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or doesn't come to pass or, is, or doesn't come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. You can tell if he or she claims to be a prophet whether or not they are. In the book of Joshua, in Joshua you also now see how it said this. In Joshua chapter 1, all the way from chapter 1 verse 1 all the way to chapter 3 to verse 7. I mean it's amazing that you would have just three chapters worth and it just repeatedly claims divine inspiration directly from God. You see, you hear things like this, after the death of Moses, the Lord spoke to Joshua, this day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that just as I was with Moses, I will be with you. And in Joshua chapter 24, verse 26, it says, and Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. Then in Judges, in the book of Judges, we see this clearly. And it says this in Judges uh, 1, 2. Judges chapter, Judges chapter 1, verse 2 says this. And, and this is after the death of Joshua, 
The book of Judges reveals, it says, and the Lord said. So now this is, it's authenticating that God is the one who's giving forth the word. And again, later on, we see in Judges chapter 6, from verses 2 to 5, it says this, God spoke to Gideon. God is doing the speaking. Gideon is receiving and writing down. The angel of the Lord, we see in Judges chapter 2, in Judges chapter 5, Judges chapter 6, Judges chapter 13, the angel of the Lord appeared with a message on several occasions on behalf of God. Clearly, this is divine inspiration. How about the book of Ruth? Well, let's look at the book of Ruth. This book was probably appended to the book of Judges in its original position, right? and many hold to that opinion, right? and as a result, needs no explicit reference to God speaking because it was appended to the book of Judges. However, this book does give a record of divine activity as it records an important link in the messianic chain and namely the ancestors, the ancestors of David, the king Boaz and Ruth. We see that in Ruth chapter 4 and verse 21 and then we see it later on mentioned in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 1 verse 5 and 6 makes a direct reference to back to the book of Ruth. So if we, were, if, if we had any doubt about the book of Ruth, it should be clear. Now, 1st and 2nd Samuel. Let's look at 1st and 2nd Samuel. Now, the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel, which were originally one book, have many references to the voice of God. Through Samuel, the tradition, the traditional author of the book, of these books records this. How about 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 11? And the Lord said to Samuel. So who's the author? The Lord. We see in 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 1. Thus the word of Samuel came to all Israel. We see in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, 29, it adds this. The acts of the King David from the first he says, from, from first to last are written in the chronicles of Samuel, the seer, in the chronicles of Nathan, the prophet, in the chronicles of Gad, the overseer, the seer. This supports the, and indicates the, eye, the books are prophetic, and hence they are absolutely authoritative. How about first and second kings? First and second kings. Let's look at this. Now, these books have no explicit claim to inspiration. However, tradition ascribes them to Jeremiah the prophet. And we see that in, in the writings, okay, of Baba Badrath, okay? We see those writings which would automatically assume them to be prophetic. The emphasis of the divine ministry of the prophets and the prophetic viewpoint of the books of Kings would confirm the traditional view that some prophet wrote these books, hence they too would be divinely authoritative. In First and Second Chronicles, we see this now. These books lack an overt claim to inspiration, but they do present an authoritative history of Israel, Judah, and the temple from the priestly point of view. The books assume authority rather than stating or claiming it up front. And because the books are descriptive rather than didactic or teaching, there is no need for an explicit reference to the message as being as thus says the Lord. There is, however, an implicit yet clear thus the Lord, thus does the Lord. We see that in 2 Chronicles in chapter 35, okay? And you see it here in verses 20 to 21, which is even more discernible than in the book of Kings. And then how, what about the books from Ezra to Nehemiah? From Ezra to Nehemiah. Well, continuing, continuing with the temple-centered history of Judah, Ezra through Nehemiah declares definitively that God was responsible for the restoration of the deported nation. We know that. Although the book makes no explicit claim for its inspiration, there is, and again, a clear assumption that it is the record of God's deeds, and such a record is no less authoritative than the record of God's words itself. Then we see the book of Esther. The book of Esther. 
the book of Esther fits into the same category as Ezra through Nehemiah, even though the name of God is absent from this particular book, from the book of, Ex of, of Esther, except in the acrostic form, the Hebrew acrostic form, nonetheless the presence of God is certainly evident as he protects and he preserves his people. The book implicitly claims to be a true record of God's providence over his people, which is what inspiration means. Then the book of Job. Now, in Job, not only does the author claim to give a view uh, into the very council chamber of heaven, because that's, we see that in Job chapter 1, Job chapter 2, eh? but he records the actual words, the actual words of God spoken out of the whirlwind. We see that in Job chapter 38 and verse 1. Between, between let me tell you something. Uh, we, between chapters 2 of the book of Job all the way to the end in chapter 38, an accurate record of what Job and his friends said is actually presented. So it must be an inspired word of God. How about the book of Psalms? Now, in the book of Psalms, the book addressed primarily to God because Psalms can hardly be expected to say, God said, or thus says the Lord, back to himself. There is, however, within the very selection and the structure of the Psalms, a divine approval of the theology and the truth which is reflected in the varied spiritual and the varied spiritual experiences of all of the psalmists. It is apparent that God moved particular men to record their selected experiences with his approbation for his future generations, with his approval. The last five Psalms sum up the divine exhortation praise the Lord. This is a book in which God declares how men should praise him. In fact, in 2 Samuel chapter 23 and verses 1 and 2 says that David who wrote many of the Psalms was spirit directed in his utterances. We see that very clearly laid out. Then we see the book of Proverbs, the book of Proverbs. The book is introduced as the Proverbs of Solomon. We see that in Proverbs chapter 1 verse 1 that Solomon claims that these words of wisdom to be the word of God is evident when he writes this. In Proverbs chapter 22, look at this in verses 20 and 21. Proverbs 22 verses 20 to 21 says this, Have not I written to you excellent things of counsels and knowledge to make you know the certainty of the words of truth that you may correctly answer to him who sent you. It will be remembered that Solomon's wisdom was, was, um, was God given for that very purpose to help his people. We see that very clearly. 1 Kings chapter 3 verse 9, Proverbs 25 and following are the Proverbs of Solomon which Hezekiah the king of Judah just transcribed and we see that in Proverbs 25 verse 1. But nonetheless they're Solomon's. Proverbs chapter 30 and Proverbs 30, chapter 31 each claim in the first in the first verse to be an oracle or an utterance as the um, King James Version says, okay, the New King James Version says from God. And we see that again in 2 Chronicles chapter 9 verse 29 back with regard to Proverbs. How about the book of Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastes? Well, this book has clear authoritative exhortations. This is very clear. In the book of Ecclesiastes in chapter 11 verse 19, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 1, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 12, which lead to this definite, to this very distinct and definite conclusion which says this, in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 3 says this, when all has been heard, fear God, keep his commandments, because this applies to every person. That is, the teaching of his book claims to be the word from God on the subject. Now, Song of Solomon, the Song of Solomon. Although this particular book has no explicit claim for his divine inspiration, this book was thought to be inspired by the Jews on the grounds that it gave a picture of the Lord's love for Israel. Others have suggested that it is God's words about the sanctity of marriage. Whatever the interpretation, 
the implication is that the book is a revelation from God about the intimacy and the purity of love, whether it be human or divine. Then we get to the prophets, to the prophets, right? And now we get to all the prophets, or what the churches call the major prophets and the minor prophets. I don't like those terms, major prophets and minor prophets, because, it, the, well, the terms themselves just don't make any sense whatsoever. A prophet's a prophet. Now, the reason why they call major prophets and minor prophets has to do with the size of each one's book and the, the amount of writing that each one did. So those who wrote a lot, those, those books that are much thicker and has more chapters in them, they're called the major, and the ones who are smaller books are called the minor, but not in stature, not in character, not in quality, and not in, in, not as well, and including not in inspiration. So I don't like those titled major and minor, but in, we're just talking about the prophets in general, okay? The prophetic books may be summarily, uh, summarily treated together as one whole section, okay? Because the record is replete with distinctive claims as to the divine origin of the individual messages. Uh, we see that in um, Isaiah chapter 1, for example, verses 1 and 2, where it says, And the vision of Isaiah, for the Lord speaks... Uh, Jeremiah, to which Lamentations was originally appended to. We see that in Jeremiah chapter 1 as well, verses 1 and 2. Je and we see the words of Jeremiah, to whom the word of the Lord came. We see this in Ezekiel, where it says in Ezekiel 1, 3, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel. Uh, we see this in Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 21. Um, and we see that in the Hebrew Bible, okay, but each one has an expression explicit claim as Amos does, Obadiah does, Jonah does, Micah does, Nahum does, Habakkuk does, Zephaniah does, Haggai does, Zechariah and Malachi. And although many of these revelations were given originally in oral delivery, they were eventually pres preserved in written form. Numerous references to such written utterances from God are provided and we see that in 2 Chronicles chapter 21 verse 2 we see that in Isaiah chapter 30 verse 8 we see in Jeremiah 25 13 we see in Jeremiah 29 11, 29 1 Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 2 Jeremiah 36 verse 2 we see in Jeremiah 51 60 we see it in Ezekiel 43 11 we see it in Daniel chapter 7 verse 1 and Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 2 so we see repeatedly over and over and over again okay the claim of inspiration is implicit and explicit throughout Every single, every single book of the Old Testament, and where it is not explicit, it is implicit by mention, by being mentioned and refer, in reference to by another book in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. Welcome back to our class. This is Lecture 10, Part 2. Now we want to enter into a discussion or an attempt to an, a discussion, an explanation of the books that lack explicit claim for inspiration. For the books that lack explicit claim for inspiration. The vast majority of the books of the Old Testament, about 26 of them, of the 39, explicitly claim that they are God's word to men. So we know that out of the 39 books of the Old Testament, 26 have an explicit claim. That's really important that this is God speaking to men. But some do not have such a clear statement as to their origin. Now, several reasons may be offered in the clarification of this important matter since it continues to be a hotly debated topic. Now, there are, uh, here's what I want to try to do with you is to get into some of the reasons behind it. Uh, it may appear at times that it is convolutin is because some of the arguments are convolutin. <laughs> That's the reason why. 
However, every book is included within the organic unity of its section. In other words, when we say organic unity, uh, the book is divided into the Pentateuch. Okay, so if we took the Pentateuch, that would be the first five books of the Bible. Or within the prophetic writings where all the prophets wrote, that's another section of the Bible, in which there is a distinct and as well an indisputable claim for inspiration, which fact thereby speaks for every book within that section. So the Pentateuch uh, speaks to all that section. The prophetic writing speaks to all that section. So everything that's within that section, it's clear, very clear. Mm -hmm. As a result, each individual book does not need to state its own case. The claim has already been made for it by that claim, um, made for it by the claim made for the section as a whole and confirmed by the fact that the later biblical books refer to the authority of that particular section as a whole as well. Of course, it is to be assumed that unless a book had an implicit claim to inspiration of its own, it would never have been included in the canon from the very beginning. This, however, is a matter of what we would call canonization. Canonization, and it's considered a little bit more in detail. We'll see this on later on. Um, if we get into that section in this particular course, uh, if not, it'll have to be dealt with in another section uh, much later. How about another reason? Another reason may be found in their nature, in their nature. It is only the historical and poetical books that do not contain direct statements as to the divine origin. That's basically those two sections. It would be the poetical books, it would be the historical books. Um, all of the didactic books, the books that have direct teaching, right, do have an explicit way it says, thus says the Lord, it's very clear there. Uh, the obvious reason that the historical and the poetical books do not is that they present what it basically is what God showed, that's history, rather than what God said. That's the law and the prophets. Nonetheless, there is an implicit didactic, thus says the Lord, even in the historical and poetical books. History is what God said in the concrete events of the national life of Israel, we see this, uh, as well as the national life of the pagan countries around them. <clears throat> Poetry is what God said in the hearts and in the aspirations, the, in the hearts and the aspirations of individuals within the nation. Uh, both are what God said just as much as to the explicit record. He spoke through the law and the other didactic writings. So I need you to understand how this particular form of writing is being utilized. So traditional writers of the books were men who were accredited of God with prophetic ministries. If you turn your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 4, I want to see, I want you to see this with me in verse 29. Solomon, who is, uh, who is credited by Jewish tradition with writing the Song of Solomon, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes had God-given wisdom. Now, <clears throat> when we look at the Song of Solomon, we look at Proverbs, we look at Ecclesiastes, uh, we see the, uh, word, the books of wisdom, the poetic books. Um, but clearly in 1 Kings, way back in 1 Kings, this is what we're told. Now God gave Solomon wisdom and he says very great discernment and the breath of mind like the sand that it is on the seashore. So we're told clearly in Scripture that God has divinely endowed Solomon with wisdom beyond the years and that of most men around him. So he is to be led of God by God through God okay, for the purposes of glorifying God and in, 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 in speaking to men. So we see that clearly there. So if he is a godly inspired man of God who has been given the wisdom above all that of all others, uh, then, then it gets a little difficult to discuss and or to argue about the Song of Solomon or the book of Proverbs or the book of Ecclesiastes as not being books written or inspired by God. Furthermore, he fulfilled the qualification of a prophet, of a prophet laid down. We see that in Numbers chapter 12 in verse 6. 
one to whom God spoke in visions or dreams. Uh, I want you to see this with me very clearly here. <clears throat> and as well as in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 9. So let's look at those two scriptures. Numbers chapter 12, verse 6 says this. He said, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, he says, I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision. I shall speak with him in a dream. Clearly, Solomon is one of them. First Kings chapter 11, verse 9 says, Now the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. So this is the same God and the same Solomon. Now look at David just briefly with me. David is credited with writing nearly half of the Psalms. And although the Psalms themselves do not lay direct claim to divine inspiration because they don't do that, David's testimony of his own ministry is recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 23. And we see in 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 23 verse 2 says this, The Spirit of the Lord spoke to me, spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. And here we have about roughly more or less about half the, uh, half the Psalms uh, somewhere in the neighborhood, about 75 of the Psalms that are explicitly written by him or indirectly talks about him, was mentioned by him, or is accredited to him. So that's about half the Psalms. Uh, Jeremiah, who is thought to be the traditional author of the first and second Kings, has well as uh, um, has a well-known prophetic credentials. We know that. Because Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 4 says this, Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, So Jeremiah makes it very clear that God is speaking to him. In Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 17, it also says, Now gird up your loins and arise and speak to them all which I command you. Do not be dismayed before them or I will dismay you before them. Now this, that they didn't have much of a choice on that issue. And then you look at Chronicles. Chronicles and, all, and then from Ezra all the way to Nehemiah uh, are attributed to Ezra the priest himself. Um, that's really where, um, where tradition holds that it's Ezra who's doing the writing. He was a priest who functioned with all of the authority of, the pro, of, of a prophet interpreting the law of Moses as well as instituting the, silver, the civil and religious reforms thereupon in Israel, if you recall that. Um, you can go back to Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 10. It says, See, I have appointed you this day over the nation and over the kingdoms to pluck up and break down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. We see in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 13 says this. Um, it, it, it says, uh, The word of the Lord came to me a second time saying, What do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot facing away from the north. So then you see either the books of the Old Testament testify for themselves or the men who are believed to have written them almost without exception claim them to be the authoritative word of God. Now let's look at now that section called the claim, the claim of inspiration in the law, in the books of the law, as well as in the prophets. Let's look at that section. Perhaps the earliest and the most basic division of the Old Testament scriptures was that of the law and the prophets. That is, the five books of Moses and then all of the prophetic writings that came after them. The New Testament refers to this uh, basically twofold arrangement. Um, about a dozen different times in the New Testament, it talks about the law and the prophets, the law and the prophets, the law and the prophets. Well, basically, uh, that's how it's split up uh, because you see this repeatedly in the New Testament as a reference back to the Old Testament. Mm. We see that the New Testament, and only once does it even suggest a possible threefold. Uh, we'll see that in a little bit here. So let's look at this. Let's look at this just 
so that we have an idea about this. Right? Because it's about a dozen times it says this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. That's that Old Testament. Mm -hmm. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill it. This is Jesus himself speaking. So he himself calls it the law and the prophets. Um, and then in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, he says, In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. So we see once again Jesus making a twofold reference to the Old Testament scriptures. And then only one, and, and we see this, by the way, another ten times also in the New Testament. It's about another ten times I've mentioned, but I won't bore you with that. And you can also see that at one time it's, there is a possibility of a threefold. We know that. In, here we see it in Luke chapter 24. And look at that at, with me in the book of Luke chapter 24, verse 44, says this. Now he said to them, these are my words, which he says, I spoke to you while I was still with you, that at all times which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So here we find the Son of God, the Word, the Lagos, right? And as it says in John 1.1, 1, 1, we see here he himself declaring that the Psalms are inspired, the inspired word of God. However, in the same chapter, Jesus refers to Moses and the prophets as being all the scriptures. And that's what he says. We see that in Luke chapter 24, verse 27. So within the Old Testament itself, there is a basic twofold division, if you will, between the law and Moses and all the prophets who came after him. Again, we see this suggested highly uh, and very clearly in the book of Nehemiah as an example. Uh, look at Nehemiah chapter 9. We're told in verse 14. So that you may, so you may know, so you may known to them your holy Sabbath, and laid down for them the commandments and statutes and the law through your servant Moses. We see in Nehemiah chapter nine, verse twenty-six. But they, but they became disobedient and rebelled against you, and cast your law behind their backs and killed your prophets who had admonished them, so that they might return to you and they may com and committed great blasphemies. Uh, we see also in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, we see in verse 2, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed the books of the numbers of the years, which were revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah, the prophet of the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. We see also in Daniel, chapter 9, verse 11, he says, Indeed, all Israel has transgressed your law and turn aside, not obeying your voice, so that the curse has been poured out on us along with the oath which is written in the law of Moses and the servant of God, for we have sinned against him. And the reason I take the time to, to, to actually go through this is because we have so many arguments uh, being presented to us today questioning the authenticity, the authority of the Word of God, and not to mention that so many in the church today, I am never concerned about what the devil is doing. I'm never concerned about what the world is doing. I'm never concerned about what the, what the culture is doing. It's the church. The problem lies in the church where we where we intellectually say, yes, this is the Word of God, but in practice, we reject the Word of God. And sometimes it's on the basis that you don't believe in His own authenticity and His own authority. And I want you to understand that here we have God Himself is making, uh, making it uh, explicit for us to understand that this is His Word. This same twofold division is carried on in the period between the Old and the New Testaments. Uh, if you want to look at the, uh, the non-canonized uh, books that exist out there, that would be 2 Maccabee as an example, verses 15, I mean chapter 15, verse 9. And in the Qumran community, the Manual of Discipline, you should read that. Uh, for example, that would be chapter 1, verse 3, chapter 8, verse 15, chapter 9, verse 11. So there's a consideration of these two divisions of the Hebrew Old Testament will reveal that each claim for itself what one claim for the other as regards to the matter of divine inspiration. <laughs> 
And you go, well, Brother Eddie, you're just beating this horse down. Didn't anybody tell you, Brother, that this horse is dead? Uh, apparently, he's not dead. Uh, I don't believe that the horse is dead. You know, I don't believe that you know you shoot you know, that you continue to beat a dead horse. I don't think so. I I, I reject that out, outright because so many people. This is let, let me give you an example. You hear so many people say this. Yeah, but the Bible was written by man. So what are they saying with that statement? What what exactly what what are they, what, what, what are they attempting to say with that statement? What is it that they're trying to say? What is it that they're implying? Well, they're, they're implying that it's not an inerrant word, it's not an infallible word. They're implying that, that this is not the word of God. They're implying that it has error because man touched it, he had something to do with it, and all kinds of things. So we hear this argument being stated over and over again. So please, do not underestimate the importance of understanding okay, the divine inspiration of the word of God. How about the law? Let's talk about the law. You know, people tell you all the time, well, you know, that's just, it's not relevant today. It's not relevant. We live under grace. Really? How about the Ten Commandments? You know, you see the Ten Commandments repeated it, it, uh, over and over and over again, about 127 times in the New Testament. And people say, wow, the old, you know, you have to understand that Ten Commandments is an old relegated uh, um, word and it's no longer pertinent to us. It's, you know, it's just old fashioned, you know, it's antiquated, it's this, it's that. Well, then you might as well just take out the whole Bible and throw it out the window, including the New Testament, because it's repeated about 127 different times um, explicitly and implicitly in the New Testament. So let's talk about the law. The first and the foremost important section of the Old Testament is what we would call the Torah, the Torah, or the law of Moses. The claim for inspiration in this section of the Bible is very, very distinct and has already been seen from the previous examination of the individual books of the law. We did that. But I want to revisit that because... I, what troubles me, perhaps even more so, in the postmodern era that you and I find ourselves in, is that I have come across so many Christians who tell me, I just really don't bother with the Old Testament because it's old. What are you saying with that? And that just doesn't make any sense to me. It just doesn't make any sense to me. In fact, you cannot have a proper understanding of the New Testament without having engaged profoundly in the Old Testament. So let's look at the claim for the law in the law for inspiration. I mean, this is God speaking. Now, the books of Exodus, we're going to see this, um, and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, they all make explicit claims. Every single one of them make explicit claims okay, to inspiration, to divine inspiration. And to say otherwise, in my mind, is blasphemous. Now, if you take, for example, Exodus chapter 32, 16, it says, the tablets were God's work. And the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. That's pretty clear. If you don't think that's divine inspiration, then I have no idea what you're thinking about. How about Leviticus chapter 1, verse 1? It says, And then the Lord called Moses and spoke to him in, from the tent of the meeting, saying, That's divine inspiration. Numbers chapter 1, verse 1. And then the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tent of the meeting on the first of the second month, in the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Again, Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 16 says, The Lord said to Moses, it can't be any more clear than that, Behold, you are about to lie down with your fathers, and this people will arise and play the harlot, it says, with the strange gods of the land into the midst of which they are going, and will forsake me, he says, and break my covenant which I have made with them. With them. Genesis alone. Genesis alone has no such direct claim. However, Genesis is two, it, in Genesis 2 was considered to be part of the book of Moses. We know that to be true because Nehemiah chapter 3 says that and 2 Chronicles 35 says that and by virtue of the association of the same divine authority. Look what it says, Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 3 verse 1. 
Then Elijah and the high priest arose with his brothers and the priests and built the sheep gate and they consecrated and hung, it, and hung its doors and they consecrated the wall of the tower of the hundred and the tower of the Hanel. In Second Chronicles 35, 12, it says, And then they removed the burnt offerings, and they might give to them the sections of the fathers' households of the lay people to present to the Lord, as it is written in the book of Moses. They did this also with bulls. And we see that laid out very clearly here in the book of Genesis. So whatever holds for one book holds for all of them in that particular section. In other words, a claim for by one book in this canonical and the canonical section is thereby a claim of all of them, since they were all unified under this title, such as the Book of Moses and all the Book of Moses and all the Law of Moses. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to be clear of the inspiration of the Word of God. Joshua 1 8 says, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. How? He says, By ensuring that the word of God does not depart from your mouth whatsoever. That is the word of God. Why? because it is inspired. Welcome back to our classes, Lecture 10, Part 3. Now, I want to get into a section about the claims for the inspiration of the Old Testament by the New Testament. There's a course that a number of years ago I was teaching on, and it was the use, how, the old, how the New Testament uses and utilizes the Old Testament. Let me go back and um, make some previous statements and repeat some previous statements that I had made, and that is that it is incomprehensible to me that you can spend so much time in the New Testament without ever returning to the Old Testament. I, I, th that's my personal problem. I don't understand that. I, I don't. Because it's really difficult to understand the New Testament in its proper context or contextually without going back continuously into the Old Testament. Since we are discussing the issue of the inspiration of the Word of God, the inspiration of the Old Testament. Let's look at it from the point of view of the New Testament. Eh? And the New Testament has varied descriptions of the Old Testament as a whole, and each declares in its own way the divine origin of the entire canon of the Hebrew Scriptures as, uh -huh. So I want you to see that with me, that the New Testament references to the Old Testament as a whole. And, and this should, um, if you're a serious student of the Word of God, a serious student of the Bible, a serious student of the Scripture, a serious student of thus says the Lord, and the Lord set, a serious student of the Law and the Prophets and the Psalms, then you need to really understand that the Bible is one book. Okay? And it is one complete thought pattern of our majestic God that we serve. We, we find different terms in, that are used in the scriptures in the Bible that mean the same thing. Let's take, for example, the term scripture. Scripture. Now, the New Testament uses the term scripture in a very technical sense. It occurs some 50 50 times, and in most cases, that uh, of the 50 times that you see it, it refers unmistakably to the Old Testament as a whole. It's about 50 times in the New Testament you see this term scripture, and it's talking about the Old Testament. That's what it's making reference to. To, to the first century Christians, the word scripture meant primarily the canon of the Old Testament, which is called sacred. You see this. Uh, when you talk about the scriptures, anybody in the New Testament era in the first century, they had a clear understanding we were talking about the Old Testament. I, I would imagine that the, um, 
the postmodern Christian today, if you were if you were able to uh, be transported back in time into the first century, you would be completely lost in the in the church. You wouldn't have a clue what they were talking about because they understood scripture to be the whole of scripture to be the Old Testament because that's all they had. And so they had a very clear understanding of God. Let me give you some examples. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, it says this, and that from a childhood you have known the sacred writings the sacred writings, that's talking about the Old Testament, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Clearly, the Old Testament said that salvation was by grace, by faith alone in Christ Jesus. It taught that. This was not a New Testament idea. We see in Romans chapter 1, in verse 2, another example which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. In the Holy Scriptures. A clear reference to the entire Old Testament. These they acknowledge to be inspired of God. So it's talking about the Old, the Old Testament Scriptures were inspired of God. Again, go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and the rule for faith and for practice. We see this very clearly in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 17, as well as Romans 15, 4. So let's look at it very clearly. I mean, let's just go back there. 2 Timothy 3, 16 says, All Scripture uh, cannot be more clear than that. Am I right? I mean, I, I'm not speaking to the wall here, am I? I just, I just want you to think about this for a moment with me. He says, All Scripture is God breathed, because that's what it means by all scripture is inspired, it's God breathed, he is the author and he is the source, by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Now notice, notice what the, all the scriptures is for. How can you ignore the Old Testament? How do you do that? How about 2 Timothy 3.17? So that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. This is all reference to the Old Testament. <coughs> Although it's clearly stated here in the New Testament, but it's all reference to the Old Testament. How about Romans chapter 15, verse 4? For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. It wasn't written for our entertainment. It says, for our instruction, so that through perseverance, look at this, so through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, Old Testament, we might have hope. Now, several New Testament passages may be cited okay, to illustrate this point. So I have 12 points to make about this, and this is what I want to engage in here at this point. I want you to see this with me. We have a lot to go through, so I need you to put your running shoes on. I need you to really hunker down here and stay and stay with me in these next in this next few minutes as we as we get through this section together. And I want you to see this with me because it's really important that you understand this. How about in the book of Matthew? Now, in Matthew chapter twenty-one, verse forty-two, Jesus charges the Pharisees, saying this. This is what he says. To them. Did you never read in the scriptures? Did you never read in the scriptures? No, did you never read the Old Testament? I, I, I believe he can make that same charge to us today. The question implied that they were ignorant of their own sacred authority, that which was the Old Testament. The same problem we would have today if you were to speak to the majority or the overwhelming majority of Christians today who have never touched the Old Testament. Look what he says in Matthew chapter 21, verse 32. He says, Jesus said to them, he didn't ask them, he said to them, did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone, this came about from the Lord, and it was marvelous in our eyes. He's talking about the salvation. He's talking about the Messiah. The, the Messiah. How about in Matthew chapter 22, 
And in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus answers the Sadducees as well. Now, remember, he was talking to the Pharisees. Now he's talking to the Sadducees. Okay? Uh, you know, Jesus is no respect of person. We can clearly see here that he speaks to the Sadducees and he says this. He says, he says, uh, he says in Matthew 22, 29, he says, And Jesus answered and said to them, the Sadducees, You are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures, the Old Testament, nor the power of God. Well, in Matthew chapter 26, turn your Bibles there to verses 54 and 56, and let me show you something here. Even on the eve of his betrayal, when he was about to be tr betrayed, right, Jesus refers to the Old Testament scriptures, and this is what he says. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 54, he says, How then will the scriptures be fulfilled? How then will the Old Testament be fulfilled, which say that it must happen? happen this way. Here you have repeatedly divine inspiration being claimed with authority by the Son of God, who is the Word. He is the Logos. We see in Matthew 26 and verse 56, he says this, but all this has taken place to do what? To fulfill the scriptures, that's the Old Testament, of the prophets, then all the disciples left him and fled. There was no arguing. You couldn't argue. Again, go to Luke. Let's go to New Testament. Luke, now look with me in Luke chapter 24. Because Luke 24 is a critical, critical passage in the present discussion. For Jesus not only opened to the disciples the scriptures, we're going to see that in Luke uh, 24, 32, but the scriptures are described as everything written about Christ. And we see that in verse 27. I want you to see this with me. Earlier in the same chapter, while re relating Christ's exposition of the Old Testament law and the prophets, Luke called these all the scriptures. Let, let's just look at this as an example. Luke chapter 24, 32. They said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road? So remember, Jesus catches up to the, the disciples who are walking on the road, to the, you know, on the, on, on, on the road, okay, uh, on the way to Emmaus. So you remember, they're walking on the road. And, um, and this is what it says. And they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining what? The scriptures, the Old Testament. To us. How about Luke 24, 44? And Luke 24, 44 says, Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses, Old Testament, and the prophets, Old Testament, and the Psalms, Old Testament, must be fulfilled. How about Luke 24, 27, where it says, Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, what did he do? He explained to them the things concerning himself, he says, in what? In all the scriptures, in other words, in all the Old Testament. How about John chapter 5? In John, I'm sorry, John chapter 2, it says, and, and here, is, here is Jesus. Now, he, Jesus states um, that after, this, and this is what John chapter 2 is talking about. John chapter 2, verse 22 states that after Jesus was raised from the dead, here's what the disciples said. It says in John 2, 22. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they what? And they believed the scripture and the word which has Jesus has spoken. them. What scripture? Talking about the Old Testament. In John chapter 5, in verse 39, Jesus says to the Jews now, you search the scriptures, you search the Old Testament, because you think that in them you may have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. He's talking about the veracity of the Old Testament because it talks about him. Several times in the Gospel of John, the word scripture, singular, is used without citing a specific passage 
from the Old Testament. For example, look with me in John chapter 7, verse 38. It says, and I want you to see this, okay? And, you, and we're gonna, in fact, let's go through, let's go to John. We have about one, two, three, four, about four or five scriptures. Let's look at this. I want you to see this with me. Because that statement, uh, when he says, uh, as the scriptures said, it's the same thing as to say the Bible says, right? So look at John 7, 38. It says, he who believes in me, as the scripture says, or as the scripture said, or as the Bible said, as the Word of God says, the Old Testament, everything up until that particular point in time, from Genesis to the, to the present a day, to their present day, he says, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. We see that in John 7, 38. We also see in John 7, 42, look at this. Has not the Scripture said, has not the Bible said, has not the whole Word of God said, that the Christ comes from the descendants of David and from Bethlehem, the village where David was. Oh, John chapter 19, verse 36. For these things came to pass to do what? To fulfill the scripture, to fulfill the Bible, to fulfill the word of God. Not a bone of him shall be broken. We see this very clearly. Uh, one of the things that I've done in my Bible, <coughs> um, I, I teach and preach from, a, you know, it's, a, it's a plain Bible. I have no reference notes in it. I don't have anything in it. It's just plain, just a plain Bible. And, um, and I just got it all marked up. I think nobody else can read it. You know, I've got it marked up where it lets me know that uh, throughout repeat through the Old Testament that this is God speaking. This is God speaking continuously from the Old Testament. And how can I even conceive of the idea of ignoring the Old Testament? How can I conceive of understanding the new without the old? So we see in, in John chapter 20, verse 9, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, or as yet they did not understand the Bible, as yet they did not understand the Old Testament, that he must rise again from the dead. How about John? Again, John chapter 10. Now look in John chapter 10 and verse 35, which is another crucial passage to the, to the inspiration of the Old Testament. Jesus asserts that the scripture cannot be broken. The Bible cannot be broken. The Old Testament cannot be broken. Showing that he considered the sacred scriptures to be infallible. Never once has this alluded to the possibility that the Old Testament, that the Scripture might be mistaken. You never see that once at all. In John chapter 10, verse 35, here, here's, what, here's what's taking place, and this is what Jesus says. He says, if he call them gods to whom the Word of God came, and he says, and the Scripture and the Old Testament and the Word of God, the oracle of God, the utterance of God, cannot be broken, it cannot be nullified, it cannot be discarded, it cannot be destroyed. How about the word, how about the book of Acts in the New Testament? Well, we get to the book of Acts and we see the words scripture singular and we see the words scriptures plural. We see both of them are used in the same manner as they were by Jesus. We see this again in the book of Acts. Go to book, book of Acts. And let's see this, let's start in, in Acts chapter 17. And here Paul is reasoning. And he's talking about also the Bereans, all right? You, let's just look at this. Apollos as well, as, as well. So let's look at Acts chapter 17, verse 2. And it says, according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Old Testament, from the Scriptures. So he's speaking to the Jews, the learned, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Jews in the temple from their own scriptures. We see in the book of Acts chapter 17, verse 11, look at here. Now these were more noble-minded than the, those in Thessalonica. And, that was a, and let me tell you something, the church in Thessalonica was a strong church. For they received the word with great eagerness, examining, look at this, examining the scriptures, 
plural, the Old Testament, daily to see whether these things were so. What, let me tell you something, here's a spiritual duty that the church should engage itself, and sadly enough, it does not do it. Uh, people go to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and the preacher wails away, he preaches away, he teaches the word of God and no one ever sits down at lunch or afterwards in the afternoon and says, wow, let's find out if what he said is true. Let's just, let's just now examine the scriptures to see if it's so. So few don't even do that. They just want to go home, have the lunch, go to the restaurant, have the lunch, eh? go and take a nap and watch the ball game. That's about it. Look at Acts chapter 18 verse 24. Now a Jew named Apollos, great preacher, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man came to Ephesus, and it says, and he was mighty in the scriptures, mighty in the scriptures. He was mighty in the Old Testament. He had a clear grasp of the Old Testament. He had a problem in understanding how it was going to apply in his era in the New Testament. He had no idea he was involved in the New Testament period. Look at Acts chapter 18, verse 28. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public. Look at this. And it says, demonstrating by the scriptures, the Old Testament, that Jesus was the Christ. You can clearly demonstrate in the Old Testament who Jesus the Christ is. I remember years and years ago, I was able to do that in a debate in, in Pakistan among the Muslims where I got into this debate with them and we were, and I was invited to do so, by the way, and I was involved in this thing, but they told me, you cannot bring a Holy Bible with you, you can only bring the Quran, and so I, I said, that's fine, I, I had read, the, I've read the Quran, I've studied the Quran, I've got it marked out, I've read it uh, over and over again several times, since so many, having to take so many um, uh, teaching and preaching opportunities, evangelistic opportunities, to witness the gospel of Jesus Christ, plant churches, and start a, a seminary school there and so forth in a country that is predominantly uh, Muslim. And so I thought it might be a good idea. I better study the Quran and understand what it says. And I was able to reason with them from the Quran, just like here we find Apollos doing in Acts 18, 20, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public. I did the same with the Muslims. He says, demonstrating by the scriptures demonstrating by the Quran, their Quran, that Jesus was the Christ, and thenceforth others came to Christ as a result of that. In fact, today, uh, uh, today we have 237 churches that we work with in, 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 uh, in a predominantly Muslim country who have come to Christ. Paul also repeated, repeatedly used the word scriptures, plural, to refer to the entire authoritative canon of the Old Testament. We see in the book of Romans, he wrote that God had promised the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here we see, in Romans chapter 1 verse 2 says, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the holy scriptures. We see that this is all New Testament, always a reference to the Old Testament. So the expression, when we see the expression in the scriptures, is, and what does the scripture say? You see that expression repeatedly. It's on, and it occurs several times in the, in the same epistle. For example, go to Romans chapter 4, verse 3. What does the scripture say? In other words, what does the Old Testament say? For what does the scripture say in Romans 4, 3? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as what? As righteousness. We also see in Romans chapter 9 and in verse 17 it says this, For the scriptures say, the Old Testament says, to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you. He says, my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. Again, in Romans chapter 10, verse 11, in that great chapter, it says, for the scripture says, for the Old Testament says, whoever believes in him will not be what? Disappointed. In Romans 15, 4, Paul says, for whatever was written in earlier times, was written for our instruction, so that through the perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. How can you reject and not spend time in the Old Testament? It's inconceivable to me. In Romans chapter 16, verse 26, but now is manifested by the scriptures of the prophets. According to the commandment of the eternal God has been made known to all the nations, leading to the obedience of faith. <laughs> 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, we see verse, 30, uh, verse 3 and 4. For I delivered to you as the first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to what? According to what? According to the Scriptures, according to the Old Testament, his death and resurrection, his ascension, had already been proclaimed in the Old Testament itself. 